I'm just going to, you're going to get a series of welcomes mm -hmm. and I'm the first one. So I'm Melissa Hyten. I'm the assistant principal for online and open learning and director of learning, teaching and web services in the University of Edinburgh. And um, learning and teaching and web includes which is data on the web. And I am delighted that we have now for five years, five years? Over five years. Over five years, been working on um, the data that uh, Julian and his team compiled and putting it onto the web in interesting ways. And what we're going to be talking about today is the newest version of the views onto that data and all about the people and the stories that it tells us. So um, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you if you are new to the University of Edinburgh to this building. This is the Edinburgh Futures Institute, which is a new building newly opened for us. It's not a new building. It's an old building that has been made made new and made beautiful. Um, and we're very proud of it. And so, And it's got lots of interesting spaces and shaped spaces. So please do have a explore. Um, and it used to be a hospital, as many of you who know Edinburgh will know. And I just, you know, in order to make some kind of hook with introducing the building, I usually try to find some kind of hook to the topic. Um, I just asked our experts whether there's any witch-based anecdotes about this building, but apparently not so much. So I'm just going to have to go for the personal um, in the, the building at the back uh, was where I was born. <laughs> so um, thank you all very much for coming. And I'm going to pass across to you and, and all the presenters who are going to tell you all about the work that they've been doing. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to speak for a minute or two um, just to do a bit of a Gwyneth Paltrow moment and say a few thank yous. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, we didn't take it for granted, uh, especially announcing this event just nine days ago, which is not ideal when you're trying to promote two new services. So we really appreciate you coming today. Um, personally, I'm eight years in now supporting the university and its staff and students in exploring how they can benefit from and contribute to open knowledge and open data uh, through the use of Wikimedia's free and open projects like Wikipedia and Wikidata. This is one project I'm pleased to have been involved in since 2017, when I was first invited to see what the students might be able to do with the university's landmark database, the Survey of Scottish Witchcraft. This first project with a geography student called Emma was an experiment to see if we could geolocate and put these accused women on the map. And this next version has been about the investigations and the accusations they were subjected to and plotting these events in time as well, so they can be explored in time and space now. This has been a passion project, a labor of love for all those involved, and I'm enormously pleased and proud that we can share version two with you now after five years work behind the scenes. So I hope you can see the value of universities supporting rich, important legacy projects like the Survey of Scottish Witchcraft in the longer term and universities supporting student learning in this way in what I believe is a rich and intrinsically motivating and rewarding experience for them and for the sharing of open knowledge and understanding globally. Thanks go to Dr. Melissa Hyten, seated yonder, for her leadership, vision, and forbearance. Professor Julian Goodyear, our first speaker, and Louise Yeoman for their endless knowledge, expertise, and patience. My line manager, Karen Harry, who deserves a sainthood. Uh, Andrew Millington, so over there in the purple. He deserves an extended break. <laughs> Thanks especially to the brilliance and enthusiasm of all the students I've worked with, Ellie and Ruby, being our latest two, who have taken the challenge on and done some truly amazing work that they're gonna showcase next. And I'd like to dedicate this site to Richard Lawson, our developer colleague who sadly passed away this time last year. It was a passion project for him too, and he supported all of our student interns with kindness, generosity, and just unparalleled technical wizardry. Most of all, I'd like to dedicate this site to all the accused witches of Scotland, to each of them and to the lives they lived and to their members. Without any further ado, thank you to Professor Julian Goodair, uh, who's going to preface our two student projects. Uh, and he's delight I'm delighted he's been involved with us so, with so many years and been patient with us. 
Uh, he's the project director of the Service Scottish Witchcraft and Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Edinburgh. So uh, could you clap your hands in the <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you, thank you to to you especially for you know um, organising this event, get, getting it all together, organising the map. Um, thank you to all of you for coming, and um, special thank you to um, <clears throat> Ellie and Ruby who are the Im important ones I think this afternoon. But I've been asked to say a few words about the survey and witchcraft in general, sort of in search of. Scottish witches. It feels a bit odd to be a historian in a futures institute. Um, and I, I've, I've been thinking about this. That, you know, history is about the past, isn't it? Well, actually, you know, I think history is about the present. Uh, I, it, the past is sort of back there and it happened. Um, but what history is, it's not simply the past that happened. History is our answers today to the questions that we ourselves ask about the past. And history is only important because we care about it. And why we do care, I mean, you know, assuming we do, um, you probably care at least a little bit, you wouldn't be here, but um, is because we care about the present and we care about our common humanity. Everybody's different, but we also all share a common humanity. And we try to understand other human beings and indeed ourselves, still trying to understand other human beings still trying to understand myself. It's an ongoing project that we seem to have as humans. Um, and one of the ways we do that is that we try to understand um, how people behave to each other in the past and how things have changed. You know, how did we get where we are or we came from somewhere back then? But understanding how people did things, sometimes the same, sometimes different back then is part of understanding our common humanity. So this is very much, I think, a, a, a project uh, about today. That's how it should be. Witches and witchcraft. Um, it's um, a curious thing. And some people, I think, want me to tell them sort of what a witch is and to, to give them the ultimate answer to, you know, this is the, the ultimate meaning to what a witch is and, and um, what witchcraft is. And the, the ultimate answer really is that there isn't one, it keeps changing. And you know, the word witch and the ideas around it, they swirl around and they, they get used in different ways by different people and at different times. And one of the things that strikes me is that today you can find people who identify themselves as witches. You know, you know, they think I'm a witch, and that's something they're proud of. Uh, in the period that I studied, you know, three or four hundred years ago, the time when witches were being prosecuted and burnt at the stake, being a witch was a bad thing. You know, that everybody agreed on that, and nobody called themselves a witch. You know, the, the people in the survey of Scottish witchcraft were called witch by someone else. And how they did that and what that meant. We're still trying to understand it. But there are two basic ideas that um, lead to the prosecutions of witches. And you can call them the, the bottom up and top down idea, or the sort of village witch and the demonic witch. And the sort of bottom up idea, the common folks idea, the peasants idea is. A witch is someone who causes magical harm to their neighbours. Probably her neighbours are witches. Probably a woman, though, doesn't have to be. Um, and so witchcraft, in this sense, emerges from quarrels and curses and misfortune. You know, something bad happens. Why has this bad thing happened to me? Ah, because last week I had a quarrel with old Mrs. So-and-so, and she's getting her revenge by magic. And you imagine that a woman will do that. And you don't imagine that a man will do that because he'll come around and beat you up if you uh, if you <laughs> anger a man. But if you anger a woman, she might bewitch you. But that is the fear that people have, that other people will bewitch them. And how they identify particular people as witches, I could talk about that all afternoon, but I won't. But you know, villagers can sometimes identify particular people as having committed an act of witchcraft or being a witch. 
The other idea, it's a top-down idea, it's an elite educated idea of the rich in league with the devil. The rich who sells her soul to the devil, the rich who makes a pact with the devil, um, and you know, transfers her allegiance from God to the devil. So um, sort of theological idea, and it's a group idea, it's a conspiracy. There are witches plural. You know, the devil is recruiting human agents in an effort to overthrow human society and tempt humans to sin. The, so the demonic witch in league with the devil and the village witch who harms their neighbours have got nothing in common with one another, apart from the word. But they somehow come together to produce this. And you know, we historians are still trying to work out, is this top down or is it bottom up? But it is top down in the sense that the accused witches were accused formally by the courts. This is a legal process. It's a governmental process. This is not about lynch lynchings. It's not about village popular justice. It's about the highest authorities in the land. And so all these witches who were accused have had legal trials of some kind. They weren't all executed, many of them we don't actually know. Um, <laughs> And that is partly because many of the records don't survive. When we're searching for the witches of the past, that is the people who were called witches officially, um, we can't find them all. Um, we have not got all the names. And you, you know, sometimes we know that there were uh, records that are lost where we see groups of witches and nobody can tell us much about them. Most of the actual trial records have disappeared. However, some of them do survive, and with some of them, we know quite a lot. And what we do have in Scotland, uh, and we don't have in very many other countries, and certainly not in England, is we've got a, a sort of backbone. There is a register of commissions to authorise trials, and that gives us a lot of names, places and dates. And for many, in fact, most of the, the accused witches in the survey of Scottish witchcraft, what we've got is a name from that register. And that register survives more or less complete, at least from 69. Um, and so we think we've got most of the names. It's an order to hold a trial. Was a trial actually held? We don't always know. Were they convicted? We don't always know. Probably the answer is yes and yes for most of them. I'm sorry to say. Um, but we, we can't be sure for each of them. But we've got a lot of names, a lot of places, and a lot of dates. And for a few of them, maybe 5 or 10%, we've got a great deal of information. And this morning I was editing a particular sort of witchcraft case. It's a, actually a man, Alexander Drummond. And the authorities wrote over 20,000 words about the magic that he was supposed to have been doing. So we know a lot about him. And that's going to be published next year. Um, so when you click on individual witches in the Survey of Scottish Witchcraft, what you get, sometimes you really don't get much more than a name, a place and a date. And the suspicion that person was probably brought to trial and they were probably convicted, probably executed, probably by burning at the stake. Almost always, as far as we can tell, they strangled them first and the dead body was burned. But that is what they do to convicted witches because they don't like them. The villagers don't like them. The authorities don't like them. Why witchcraft trials come up in the 17th century, then 16th century, and then down again, and you can see the numbers rising and then falling. I think it is to do with what I call the godless state. It is the authorities trying to inculcate correct Christianity and then losing interest and moving on to other things. Um, how long have I got? Um, I think as we started... Um, possibly later than we intended. I might just stop there and um, there will be opportunities to ask questions later, but I've got a sort of sense that um, that may be enough for Ellie and Ruby to get going on. But uh, do it, I'm, I'm gonna write those questions later rather than now. Thanks. If, if you can hold your questions for Julian, uh, and we'll sort of uh, hold your questions for Ellie and hold your questions for Ruby and we'll do them all together, hopefully with wine as well. <laughs> uh, 
while we're waiting. Please welcome Ellie Whitehead to the stage, please. Um, okay, so before I begin, I just want to echo the sentiments of everybody who stood up here before me and just thank you all so much for being here. It's really good to be able to share something that me and Ruby have been working on for so long with so many people who seem really interested. So thank you so much for, for taking your time out of your afternoon to come and be here. Um, so just a bit about me before we begin to introduce myself. I'm a recent graduate from Edinburgh where I studied a Master's um, of Research in History and my dissertation was titled Satan's Invisible World Discovered, the Defence of the Supernatural in 17th Century Scotland. So it ties in quite well with my work at Wikipedia, which I was quite lucky about. Um, I'm assistant Wikimedian in residence here at the university, which just means that I help you and facilitate discussions between students and Wikipedia and um, engagement in sort of uh, learning and open learning. I've helped Ruby in this role work on the map of Scottish witchcraft, the new map of memorials that Ruby will tell us about later, and of course the curious walking um, Edinburgh talk, which we are here to talk about today. So Curious Edinburgh is an app and website created by the University of Edinburgh, and it's previously covered topics such as the history of medicine, the Scottish Enlightenment, and um, examples like the Uncover Ed Tour. It's got an aim of being factual and historically accurate, which I think is fantastic. And it's not a resource that I knew about before I came into the role, but I would have loved to have known about it when I was a student here. Like being able to get on your phone and walk around the city and learn more about it is such a great thing and for free as well. So make sure you do make use of it. But our specific tour, we wanted to focus in on the history of witchcraft in Edinburgh. So we want to take you through the history of the witch hunts. There's 18 stops overall, starting at Edinburgh Castle, working the way down the Royal Mile. And then we've got some other sites dispersed around the city, such as the Galilee Execution Site in Leith. Um, it's based upon information in or bouncing off from the Survey of Scottish Witchcraft. Uh, and we really took this and wanted to um, shape it uh, akin to the survey, like much of the things we do as well. So here are a list of our 18 final stops we came up with. So we work our way from Edinburgh Castle um, down, we deviate slightly to go to the Cowgate and Greyfriars Kirkyard, come back onto the Royal Mile, work our way down to Holyrood Palace, um, and we have two uh, separate stops at the end, the Potter Report and the Galilee Execution Site. There are so many sites in Edinburgh we wanted to include, but it had to make sense to walk it. So that's why we've sort of followed the spine of the Royal Mile down. And the extra um, two stops at the end are there as like an option for anybody who really wants to go somewhere else and um, have a look. So here are some of the uh, names of people we have included in the tour. So we wanted to focus on a range of different um, accused witches and their prosecutors to get a rounded view of the witch trials in Scotland and in Edinburgh more specifically. So some of you might recognise a few names up there like Agnes Sampson or John Knox, um, but we really wanted to make sure that it was uh, a rounded tour and included lots of men, as many people as we could. So our key features, it's on a website and an app. We have this map feature that you can see here, which is great. You can really see how it's uh, laid out in the city like this. Um, we have further reading resources, which um, also include links to podcasts and things like that. So it's really um, great for everyone to get involved. And what we're most proud of is our addition of the video. So we really wanted to make this content not only accessible, but engaging for people. And we were very, very kind that Julian and Louise were so gracious as to come and spend two afternoons with me and Ruby to record and you and to record these videos. Um, so just going through, they're just reading the text, um, what is on the app, but it really brings it to life. And obviously they're, they're the experts in it. So it's great to hear it from their mouths themselves. So obviously with a, a project such as this, there are going to be challenges and decisions we have to make along the way in order to get the right balance um, of what we want to do. So I'm going to go through a few of them now. So to include or not to include, this is something that I think me and Ewan had spoke about a few times is who do we want to, um, who do we want to involve in the tour? Who do we want to include? Should it just be accused witches? Or should it also include the prosecutors? 
Um, and we went with the decision to include these prosecutors and accused witches, because without this, you're not getting a rounded view of the witch hunts in Scotland. Uh, the prosecutors were as much a part of the trials as the accused witches were. So we really wanted to ensure that you're getting all the facts that you needed in order to understand the history of the trials um, properly. So, for instance, we included names such as William Colville and John Nesbitt, Lord, Lord, Lord Delton. And I've wrote down a few bits of information about these um, individuals here because I can't get the information wrong with Julian in the room. So I have to refer and make sure I'm getting all the dates right. So William Colville was the minister of the Tronkirk in the 1640s. And the Tronkirk is one of our stops. He was an investigator who interrogated Janet Barker and Margaret Lauder in 1643. He was also principal of the university in the 1660s and 1670s, so we really felt like he had a place in the tour, um, despite being um, someone who our modern minds might look back to and sort of condemn now. Um, he still had very much a, a process in, this, in these trials. Um, and Lord Dalton was a lawyer and Lord Advocate who led the prosecution of Jean and Thomas Swear in um, 1670. So he also purchased the estate of Dalton Castle and um, where six women were accused of uh, witchcraft and dancing with the devil. So again, this is just another person who was involved in a way which we might think of poorly today, but still needs to be included um, to provide a rounded view of the hunt. So our path from original to final route was quite difficult. When I initially got the um, draft idea over from you, and there was maybe over 23 stops. 25 stops, which is quite a lot, and especially if you want to do it all in a one, it will take you all afternoon. So we really had to think carefully about what we were going to pick, why, and um, how it would fit along the route. Uh, we wanted to make sure it was an Edinburgh focused tour because there obviously um, are so many different locations across Scotland that would be fantastic to do a similar thing with. But um, we wanted to make sure that the scope was uh, walkable because it is a walking tour. So we focused in Edinburgh. Uh, and we really wanted to ensure historically accurate locations. So to make sure we're researching where we're dropping a pin and it's not just in a random place we think it is, to really go behind the history and work out where um, these people would have um, been connected to. And this for me was probably the largest thing that I grappled with when helping to create this tour uh, was the fact versus fiction. So we really intended to challenge misconceptions popular folklore and the public imagination about the history of witchcraft in Edinburgh. We wanted to strike a balance between making it educational and entertaining, um, including how to properly discuss sensitive topics. So I think that this is a really, really important point, just because that there might be an urban myth about a certain witch or warlock that might not be true, doesn't make it any less interesting or any less useful. But for our tour, we wanted to do it specifically about the factual um, walking tour history of Edinburgh. So that's why we've sort of wanted to um, challenge these misconceptions in our tour. Um, so uh, I did a few things to be able to combat this and work out the fine line between it, such as relying a lot upon um, Julian and Louisa's sort of expertise. And I also got in touch with uh, an academic down at the University of Warwick, Dr. Martha McGill. She has created a card game, an educational resource for university students and um, school students about the witch hunt. So it's called Witch Hunt 1649, if you want to check it out, it's fantastic. Um, but I had a conversation with her about how she struck the right balance between this sort of um, game thing seeming educational and fun but it's about a quite a sensitive topic so um, just making sure I reached out to as many people as possible so for a case study to sort of show you how um, this all encapsulates into a stop um, I've decided to talk about stop four which is the upper bow and in this tour in this tour this is where we talk about um, Major Thomas Weir and Jean Weir so um, Major Thomas Weir and Jean Weir have sort of become mythologised in Edinburgh folklore um, and there's many stories as you walk down the grass market I'm sure you'll find a tour guide standing there saying and he died under a pole and he was holding it it was burning uh, we wanted to make sure that we um, stepped back from the urban myths and really looked into what the actual story was and reflect that correctly so uh, Major Thomas Weir got his reputation as a warlock after he had died. Um, he actually wasn't executed for witchcraft and neither was his sister Jean. She was accused of witchcraft, but the charges were dropped. They were actually executed on charges of incest, um, 
Thomas Weir on bestiality and, and adultery. So we really wanted to um, get that right specifically. And it's definitely a stop I've had to think about for, for a while because it's a, a story which is so, um, the people of Edinburgh are so interested in it. We also wanted to locate the exact location of the forgotten West Bow. So it, it's located, um, location is demolished now, but it's somewhere between Victoria Terrace and up Victoria Street. So to make sure that I got this right and um, placed his marker down on the tour correctly, I reached out to some other academics just to try and hone in on where it could be. And I think I found a pretty accurate um, representation of the location of where the Weir's house would have been. But if there's anyone in this room who looks at the tour and thinks it's wrong, please tell me. I'd love to hear it. Um, but I think it's accurate. I hope it's accurate. And as I said before, we really wanted to ensure we were myth busting. So overall, my experience and my main takeaways from this. I feel after working on this project that education should not take away from entertainment, but also vice versa. We should really make sure that we um, toe the line between both and that they both work together because just because something's factual doesn't make it any less interesting. I, I feel that that's lost a lot of the time um, in situations like this, but it's something that uh, was really important to me. Uh, I, I would advise anyone uh, wanting to embark on a project like this to consult as many professionals, academics, experts and other sources of information as possible. Don't just rely on the internet and don't, it's fantastic, but don't rely on just the internet and the books. Talk to people, get out there, reach out um, and listen to a few podcasts as well because they're always very useful. Uh, and finally, fact and fiction both have their own place in these projects, but it's useful to make sure that the context is explained. So I've touched on this, but just to reiterate that, um, it, it's really important to have this context on why things are important and why we talk about them in the way they do and why we should um, represent them accurately. So finally, this is where you can find us. If you scan this QR code, it will take you to the app store where you can download the Curious Edinburgh app and get exploring Edinburgh with the history of witchcraft in Edinburgh tour. Um, my contact details are down below. This is my email and my Twitter. Um, feel free to contact me if you've got any questions, you want to talk anything witchy, or you have any suggestions for the tour or any alterations. We'd love to hear you. Um, but with that, I think I'll pass over to Ruby to launch the new website. But yeah, I'll just introduce Ruby. Ruby started with us in June 2023. And she's the third of a triumvirate of student interns we've had working with us uh, called the Witchfinder General Data Visualization Internship. Tw 12 weeks uh, of work during a, the summer months, basically. And I think it's, I'm really proud that this is now realizing five years of work behind the scenes where finally the stars have aligned that we can showcase both Ellie's project and the work of all the students as well as Ruby. So that will do for me. And can we put our hands together the usual way? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about the map of accused witches site, which can be found on this link or this QR code. So as you said, this is a student project which first launched in 2019, but since then there's been numerous other interns which have also worked on the project. So first of all, I'll talk about the origins of the project, which go back to the survey, Scottish Witchcraft, which Julian and the team, Professor Julian Gooder and a team of historians at the university created. Um, so this ha is a database um, which contains information on over 3,000 accused um, witches. And it has so much information from their residence, occupation, social class, case characteristics, down to the fine details of what they were accused of from the supposed um, pacts with the devil and meeting places. Um, so this data was then uploaded into Wikidata, and that is now what the map of accused witches pulls the data from. So this began, it got uploaded to Wikidata when you and Wikimedian and Residents supported um, design for data science students um, in uploading the data to Wikidata and then helping them create engaging visualizations from it. So for anyone that doesn't know, Wikidata is like a sister project to Wikipedia. It's open linked data in a, um, a structured database. Um, so anyone can query this data once it's there and anyone can edit this data, but everything must be referenced. 
So back in um, 2017, when they did this data design for data science project, they created some visualizations such as a laser print woodcut board a map of the accused witches. And due to the success of this project, the student internship program was born and Emma Carroll was hired as the first witch finder general, general intern. And so she was a geography student and her goal throughout her 12 week internship was to geolocate all the data. And this wasn't a simple process because since the time period of the Scottish witch trials, um, lots of the place names have changed. So it wasn't just like taking the location and finding them. She had to search through historical records, maps, gazettes to try and find information about these locations. And once she had, she had to upload them onto Wikidata, which went, meant that we had the co coordinates for these locations and then they could be plotted on a map. And with the data she'd uploaded to Wikidata, the web developer Richard Lawson created the website and um, within, he'd never created a map based um, website before, but within two weeks, he managed to create this really amazing website. Um, and so this website really wouldn't exist without him. Um, following on from this, he's mentored the other interns and helped us in adding to the site until he sadly passed away last year. And we will really miss his kindness and generosity on this project. And we'll be really grateful for everything that he did. So then also we had Maggie Lynn and she really worked on expanding the data um, and Wikidata. So she added a lot of information about the investigations and trials. Um, and then that meant that these could be added to the website. And she also um, created additional visualizations such as um, a named witches network graph, which um, shows the links between who accused who, who because often due to the ordeals and torture methods within the trials, they would name other witches, well, the other women they knew as witches. Um, and she was supported by Joseph Garcia Riero, and he helped adding things to the website as um, open source web developer intern. And he also really um, worked on improving the user interface. And he did some software packages and made the timeline more responsive and meant that you could add in some features such as being able to filter multiple options at once. And then also last year, um, Claire Panella joined and worked one day a week through semester. And she created a quality data assurance framework um, which compares the data from the survey to Wikidata to check if that matches. And also Andrew Millington, who has really supported me in reviewing all the code he's done and so much work in the past week, it's really been quite a shift to get it finished in time. Um, so he's all reviewed our code and always offered his help, support and expertise. And of course, Ellie as well, who meant, as she mentioned, helped working on the map and the map of memorials and has helped provide using her knowledge and um, based on her own studies to add descriptions and more context to the website so they can make the most out of the website. I have some other notable mentions. Professor Julian Gooder, who of course this project wouldn't exist without, without the survey. And he's just always been there when we have questions, or always responds so quickly to our questions and offers his endless expertise. And also like, for example, he came in and he filmed the videos with us. So we have new videos on the website He's created an introduction to Scottish witchcraft, which we recorded. And he, we did an interview about the Scottish witch trials and the survey of Scottish witchcraft. And um, thanks to Karen and Melissa, who also have always supported the hiring of interns to work on this project. And Navino Evans, he's the creator of Histopedia, which is a new feature I'll talk about in the website in a second. And Stuart Comar for creating the icons. And Jeff Fortescue, who is helped us with the media room when recording the videos. So I continued on Claire's work with the quality assurance. So because Wikidata is editable, it means anyone can change things, which is often for the better as in the light of new information being found, things can get updated. And um, also means that some mistakes could get made. And also, um, so, this is why we wanted to quality assure the data that was on Wikidata. So what we did was read in the data from Wikidata and from the survey and compared them. And with any anomalies, we checked with Julian Goodner to work out which was right and if any mistakes had been made. 
So then this is why we're more confident that the data being displayed on the website is as accurate as we can be. Also did some user testing sessions last year. Um, so this involved in um, sessions with users who either had already quite a lot of knowledge on Scottish witchcraft or some that had little to no knowledge. Um, so this was doing sessions with them where we would ask them to perform actions on the website and watch how they respond and if they can find the things and um, ask for their general opinion on the site. And this helped us um, fix some usability issues and also get some ideas for additions to the website. For example, the people that had little knowledge on the Scottish witch trials didn't know what some terms meant. So we tried to add a lot more context to the website by adding descriptions in the filters and adding a glossary. I also worked on a JavaScript framework upgrade, which now means the website has more longevity and security and just some fixes, and we've added some new features, which I'm about to go over. So the interface has changed from the original version that launched in 2019, with the filters being on the right side, and you can now use multiple filters at once. We have a more responsive timeline, and you can also select custom date ranges if there's like time periods that you specifically want to find out about. We have the new Histopedia timeline, which is an interactive timeline which shows you the investigations in order of date and well, you can click on them and then you can get links to some of the sources the original sources like the privy council records and things like that um, and then we also have the new map of memorials the process of this was initially we did some research and um, based on kind of searching local newspapers and stuff and finding out what local areas have memorials or at least sites, like sites of interest that people associate with the Scottish witch trials. And um, from this list of memorials that we gathered, we realised that some of the memorials weren't factually accurate. For example, the Maggie Wall monument states Maggie Wall was burned here as a witch. Not only is there no record of her existing, but no record of her being burned a witch at this location. But this doesn't mean it's not interesting. We still wanted to include it because the map of memorials and sites of interest is more of a way to document how people respond to the Scottish witch trials in the years after. Um, so we decided that we would have three categories as memorials, sites of interest and tourist attractions. And this meant we could also include museums, which have sections dedicated to this. So this map really provides users with sites that they can visit um, if they're interested. There's lots of new filters. So as we've said, um, lots more investigations data has been added. So you can now um, filter by case characterizations, such as pack with the devil, property damage, and meeting places. And there's lots of new visualizations. That's a photo of the Named Witches Network graph. We have a new historic map so that you can see um, a map closer to the time period that they would have happened and there is the filter descriptions as well we have a glossary to provide users with context if they're unsure of what terms mean and the introduction to scottish witch trials page and the interviews with um, professor julian goodair for their reading page so people have a place to look if they are still interested and want to find out even more information and many more visualizations so thank you for listening. Um, this has been a really rewarding project to work on. And even just a personal level, I've learned so many professional and technical skills while working in this project. But while being able to work on something that I'm passionate and so interested in. It's also a very valuable project. It's a student collaborative effort that um, works towards open knowledge and bringing new light to the survey of Scottish witchcraft and sharing the stories and injustices that were faced by the acu those accused of witchcraft during the Scottish witch trials. So here's the QR code to the website again and the link there, and my email or Ewan's email if you want to contact us. There's also a contact page on the website. So I'm now just gonna show some pages on the site so we can get the most out of them. So this is the page that you first land on when you enter. And as you zoom in, you'll see the witches go to the locations they are and you click and click on them. And you'll see all the accused witches that lived in these locations. And then you can also filter. So if say you just want to see female, 
maybe working poor and if you want to see a female working poor midwife then you'll see that there's now only six accused which is that meet these characteristics so this really enables you to be have more precise searches to for research or personal interest and then so we've also as we said, we've added in the glossary. So the glossary is available before the below the filters list, and this will take you with a list of definitions for these occupations. And then, so as we said, we've also added in the investigations. So this is in this um, subcategory here. <laughs> Or it's a bit slow sometimes because there's so much data that is being loaded. Um, so here we can filter by primary and secondary case characterizations. We have the witches meetings map to where you can filter by pack with the devil, property damage, meetings places and meetings information. I'll show you the Histopedia page as well. So that's on the timeline search there. Um, so here you can, so first of all, the, witch, the accused witches with the most information, they show up closer to the front. But as you scroll in, even more appear and you can click on them and then you get suddenly the notes that are from the survey. You can get their page on the Survey of Scottish Witchcraft, their Wikipedia page, and here is their, um, this is also their Privy Council notes. So this is a really good way to see the actual, um, like the first of all reference point of where all this information came from. And you can also search here, say if you know the name of a specific accused witch, and there's also filters, which if you again have precise information you want to find out, for example, age of offence, you can see all the people all that were accused within the ages 10 to 19 here. And I'll show you quickly the memorials and sites of interest as well. So here's the filter sections for memorials, sites of interest and tourist attractions. And then you can see exactly where these locations are and you get a description. So this kind of is used to clear up any, um, so for example, for this is like for the, mon the Maggie Wall Monument, we clear up that there's no evidence that she actually existed. So also, or it describes here what this um, Craig Miller Castle, what that link is to the Scottish Witch Trials, and it has a, an external link as well if you want to find out more on the street address so you can visit it. I um, hope you all enjoy exploring the website. There are so many different pages on it that I wouldn't have time to show you now, but please do look through all. There's so much information and student work on this website. Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks again for coming out at such short notice to hear about uh, these two new projects. Uh, Julian didn't get a chance to speak for very long, so this is your chance to- Shut me up. To, to, this is your chance to pick his brain and and both and ask questions about these projects as well and maybe uh, and I want uh, I want a pony suggestions about what could be worked on next uh because part part of the reason part of the thinking behind this development of the site was that last time we just wanted a home for Emma's map visualizations and we just thought, let's put it on a website. But then we thought, oh, we need to explain a lot to give context. At what is a henwife? I didn't know what a henwife was. And to a creel man as an occupation, didn't know what that was. So we provided a glossary of terms. We've got a further reading section. We've picked Ju Julian's brains in a playlist all about why the Scottish witch trials occurred, who were the individuals accused, where did the accusations come from, why did they come to an end, 
and asked, sat down for another afternoon with him and asked him all about the making of the survey of Scottish witchcraft. So that's all on there, as well as contextual pages about an introduction to Scottish witchcraft to really bring it home, uh, about to explain why these things happened. And another aspect we wanted to get delve into is what happened to these women when they were brought in for interrogation? Were they tortured? What kind of interrogations, enhanced interrogation techniques were used? And the idea was not to be salacious or triggering, but informative about their lived experiences and the mindset of the accusers as well. So that, that was our thinking about that. There's also other aspects like this, who named who, who mentioned who, and where you can click on that and see how that spread over time. Just the nature of what enhanced interrogations and this culture of fear do does to someone and naming other names. <laughs> So there's much more we could do with the, the website, but I'm now gonna open the floor to your questions. So does anyone have a question? Okay, at the back, I'm gonna scurry all the way up over here. So just tell us who you are first of all, and then ask your question and who you want to ask it to. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you to all of you for your excellent presentations. Um, my name is Rebecca. I've just finished an MSc in medieval history and um, yeah, absolutely fascinated by the, the Witchcraft Project and I'm hoping to take that further in research as well using this amazing database. Um, my question was really for everybody um, involved in the project and yeah, all of you um, with this amazing new resource now out in the wild and available for everyone to explore. I just wondered if there was any anything in particular members of the team were hoping to see other people use it for. Um, whether there are any areas or topics within the field of Scotland's witchcraft trials that you think might warrant more research using your tool. Does anyone want to field that? Shall I have a go? Yes. Uh, um, I, there's all sorts of ways it could be used. And, you know, most of the time I'm, I'm a sort of academic historian. <laughs> You know, and I don't do this kind of thing very. You know, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, um, but uh, so um, I would like to use it to um, ask cutting-edge questions and things that we don't really understand very well, such as patterns of panics. How do they spread? Do they spread? Um, do they intensify in one place or do they spread like a forest fire where you, you you get panics in one place, but only in one place at a time and then it moves somewhere else? And so um, I, I'd, I'd like to um, engage with um, statisticians to, to look at that because this data could be used in that kind of way. And there have been one or two projects along those lines, but there's, uh, uh, that's a lot more to, 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 you know, frontiers of knowledge. But there are... It can be used by almost anyone who is interested in the human condition, and it can be used to tell better stories, perhaps. <laughs> and, you know, there are all sorts of stories that people tell about historic witches, and sometimes I get told stories that I go, uh, no, no, that really isn't true. <laughs> but, you know, all sorts of stories that aren't true, you know, still have cultural meaning. So I don't really just want to be, be a misery guts and say, nah, it's wrong. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what an interesting story. Um, and uh, you know, maybe you've got this book on Scottish witches' memorials. It's full of interesting stories, mostly not true. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, you know, people want to tell stories. So if this helps people tell stories, that's another thing I hope it will be used uh, I'll just jump in and a comment. I would uh, just also to mention that Julian was very uh, insistent that we included panic periods, non-panic periods, and just make sure that people understood about what they were. But in terms of uh, what I want this site used for, I, I'm being told anecdotally that schools are using this. And I, I think that's a lot of the reason why I sort of slightly panicked that we need we need more context. We need more descriptions on here to help people that are doing work in this area and to make it as user friendly 
and understandable and navigable as possible. Because I, I think schools absolutely should be using this. But I also selfishly want more stories on Wikipedia. Because when we started this work and this section, this little navigation box only had about two or three accused witches on it. And that was back in 2018. Now it's got about 50. So I, I really want to sort of pull all the resources into one place to help people discover, because not everything's online. And even if it is online, those links decay or they get hidden behind paywalls. And where we can, we want to make life easier for, for people trying to find this information and surface it so people can understand this dark period of Scottish history all around the world. I don't know if you want to comment or anything. No, or no. okay, no more questions. More questions yeah. over here. Name. That's my name. Where to come from? Hi, uh, my name is Sarah, and I work for Wikimedia UK. Uh, firstly, you and it is the opposite of selfish to want to put something onto Wikipedia. So, boy, I think that's perfectly legitimate. Um, I have a question for Julian and a question for Ruby and Ellie. Um, Julian, obviously, you are concerned with ensuring that we separate the fact from the fiction when it comes to this subject area. But I wondered if you had a favorite witch myth. Um, and for Ruby and Ellie, um, I was wondering what the most surprising thing uh, was that you'd find when you've been working on these projects. Uh, Favourite witch myth? Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, uh, one of the ones that's in that book, I mean, the story of the witch stone of Monzi, I suppose. You know, uh, you know it's a, a prehistoric standing stone, I think. But, you know, supposedly a witch was thrown off a cliff onto this stone. Or, you know, it depends which version you read. I can't even remember the details. But she's also supposed when she was burnt in, in, in gratitude for someone who tried to save her to have spat a blue bead out of her mouth. And this then gets told as a story of the, the rise and fall of an aristocratic family. So, yeah, there's all sorts of stories um, uh, uh, associated with the witch stone of Monzi. And, you know, the witch concerned isn't even historical. So, you know, the, the, this is someone who is not on the survey. But this is the way in which stories just develop their own life and their and their own meaning. Just trying to look for the witch stone of Monty on this map. Yeah, uh, it'll it'll be on the memorials map, won't yeah. it? Yeah, is it north? <laughs> it's in the middle somewhere. Perthshire. Can it tell to just to like? Oh, okay. Anyway, I'll I'll continue looking for yeah. it. You carry on. Anyone else? Oh, Ruby and Ellie. What was what was the what was the surprise? I mean, for me, I didn't even have any knowledge on the Scottish Witch Trials, so most of it was a surprise when I was looking into it because, like, I knew they'd happened, but I didn't know how much detail was actually, like, in the survey of Scottish witchcraft that we had the names of the majority of the people accused and they had such, like, detailed notes about some of the investigations. For example, like, you have notes about like the neighborhood disputes and why the accusations came across in the first place. For example, like um, like one in particular is like because a cow fell ill, um, and so they thought it must have been their neighbor that did it. And like I just didn't know that these. I kind of thought they were just myths and didn't know that we actually had these noted down in the historical records. So that was probably what was surprising for me when I first started working on the project. Also, um. I did not know like how big a thing, how many different like side projects Wikipedia had. And then I went with you into Wikimania, the Wikipedia conference this summer, and um, to talk about this project. Um and like I, that was just such a different work, like so much more going on within Wikipedia than I was aware of. And um, so that was really interesting as well. Um, thank you for your question. I think for me, the most surprising thing was the amount of um, memorials and sites of interest and things that we were able to find in Scotland. I think uh, I, the only one I'd come across in Edinburgh was the uh, witches well up on the castle. And so um, to find that there were so many more across all of Scotland was really interesting. And also how a lot of them weren't necessarily based in fact, but their uh, local community's interpretation of events and, and how this can be reflected in sort of the physical landscape. I, I, was, I was quite surprised by the amount of that and the amount of stories that sort of prevail today, I suppose, yeah. 
I just also mentioned that we've uh, sneakily added the the witches tour of Edinburgh onto the website as well. Mm -hmm. the story map, so you can now navigate through the Curious Edinburgh tour as well through our website. And whereas there's the witches well there with Louise doing a little talk. There we go. Uh, any further questions or comments? More than a comment than a question. Uh, hello, I'm Padge. I'm a uh, independent tour guide. I'm curious about the the technology. How interoperable are these different maps? And what's the how open are they in terms of who can contribute? And then what's the vetting process for for contributions for you know accuracy and so on? I prefer that question to Andrew. It would involve Andrew. <laughs> really, the, the brains behind everything here. Yeah. And also to give him his own moment in the, in the spotlight. Thank you. Um, so the entire website's code base is online. Um, it's on GitHub. Um, I'm not sure if we've got a link. On, we might have a link in the about section. If not, I'll get one added in the next day or two. Um, but yeah, we'd invite contributions to anyone that wants to improve the website. I mean, it is just really worked upon by the interns and supervised by my team in terms of the code. Um, so yeah, if there is a, it is open for a reason. It's so that people can, if they see improvements that can be made, that they can put them in. Obviously, they'll go through a review process, but um, most of them will be um, approved through. In terms of the the maps, it's all using um, Leaflet JS, which is an open source um, uh, library, which is made by um, some uh, developers from the Ukraine, um, from Ukraine. Um, and most of the data sources, as everybody said, are open data sources as well. We, you'll be able to see if you go through the code um, exactly where we're pulling all of this from. Um, anybody can just clone the site if they want to and run it on their local machine or host it themselves as well. There's no restrictions at all um, on this. So yeah, uh, we would welcome any contributions at all. Uh, we just also, we do also welcome contributions and that's, because best will in the world, there will be import errors or historical uh, anomalies, shall we say, both in the survey data and what we've added to our open data source, Wikidata, that powers the website. Uh, so if you notice something that's wrong or local history groups or libraries, personal enthusiasts notice anything or have suggestions, we, we have a contact form and welcome uh, your scrutiny and your improvements and your suggestions. Yeah, if I could add briefly to that, um, the original survey of Scottish witchcraft, um, this is the one that was done in 2003, and the, 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 this is um, um, being driven off to a great extent, it is not really open for amendments, and it, it does have gaps in it, it does have errors. There are things that I'm embarrassed about. We've got a witch that's allegedly aged nine, and that is just a an error. You know, probably age sixty. But um, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm not really able to get under the bonnet and fix that at the moment. Um, but I'm hoping to um, be be able to do that and to add lots of other information. So the original survey has been locked down for a long time and until we sort out the code that it's based on, it's tied together with bits of string from what I understand. And no doubt there are people who can put that in more technical terms. <laughs> um, but the, there, is, there is scope and this comes back to another question about the future, you know, the, to actually add more information to the basic survey, which will allow more things on the map to light up as well. So um, I'd be delighted if people would email me with um, information about things that can be changed. And the, um, the interactive map also did fix a number of things. I think the, the, the original survey had got uh, a witch that was located, quote, in Ireland, unquote. Well, OK. Um, but, you know, there is actually a place in Orkney called Ireland. So that's what it turns out, you know. So, so that's the kind of thing that, um, you know, it's just doing a little bit more work, finding um, uh, um, f finding more details, 
and putting it all together we you know and the, the it is it is a work in progress but we are really hoping to move it forward yeah it's a building on prior learning and, and once you've got it open to the the world basically you start noticing things and and that that's part of it and you know we you know we did have perth in australia rather than perth in scotland at one point and <laughs> keith and the, the difference between keith and nether keith as well so these are all things that come up on a frequent basis any further questions or comments uh so we've got one and then two so we'll go be alex um Mike, hi, my, my name is B. Alex. I work on georeferencing and text mining and that sort of stuff. Um, I'm interested in like whether you can talk a little bit more about the sort of sustainability of interfaces like this um, uh, beautiful website that you've made available. So to keep it accessible longer term, what are the challenges? And also if you are making the data that's behind it available in different ways as well. This is kind of, does anyone want to jump in at that point? Um, I think it is quite difficult because it does, um, it's not, so this isn't like looked after, it's looked after by Andrew's team at ISG, but so it's not one of their main projects. It's always been run by student interns, so it does kind of require the constant employment of student interns to maintain. For example, this year I had to do, so it uses the Nox framework. That's what the package, um, the framework the website uses. So I had to do an upgrade on it this summer. So this is required kind of regularly, also just as interfaces change and it does need adapted quite a lot. So it is quite hard to get constant um, kind of people to work on things like this, which is like, what's well, really sad if this ever wasn't an accessible and usable website. Because recently it kind of happened to the survey of Scottish witchcraft, but it did recently get done up last year. Um, but before that, it was like the website had was quite an outdated interface. Um, so I definitely think that is a challenge. Um, but luckily the university has been so open to hiring student interns so far. So hopefully that can continue. It's also a question for Melissa, I guess, as well, and um, and maybe Andrew as well. But do you want to comment? More than a question. I think the the work that has been done by each of the students over the years, the Witchfinder Generals, and the um the the work that I think has it's a very interesting project because it it's. Rather than having a team of interns, it's interns in sequence and they build on each other's work, bringing their own expertise. And when we advertise for a Witchfinder General, um, we get a wide range of students apply and each of them have brought different approaches to the work. Um, for me, it's important that it is used. So the thing is only useful if you're using it. So um, I would love to hear that it is widely used uh, because that will help me to make the case for this being a useful and valuable thing. The more open the thing is, the more it can be used in lots of different ways. Um, the more people use it and contribute to it, it, it increases in value. Um, and I would like to perhaps see some of the use, I would like to see it used for creative writing for, you know, there's so many novels about individual witches thinking about so this these timelines, I think, are just amazing. They can show you, you know, what else was going on in other parts of the country at the time of the person you might be interested in, what they might have heard of, what was going on around them. Um, I would I think, you know, the the data can be used in so many different disciplines. So we've had so many different students from different disciplines work on this project. Um, that I am not planning to stop anytime soon. Whether that's the same as having a sustainability plan B, I'm not sure. But um, my plan is to continue the work as long as the students are happy to continue working on it and as long as people find it useful. Um, and it is student work, so the learning that they do while they're doing this um, is of great value to them as well as what we uh, enjoy the result. So. Um, I'll just also comment that uh, 
we try and document as much as possible what we do. And I know that Andrew's team put a lot of this stuff on GitHub so that it can be explored and and make sure that it's it's there in perpetuity. But uh, w Wikidata and Wikipedia are, are platforms where the Wikimedia Foundation have taken out an endowment so that they exist in perpetuity. They're too big, they're too important to fail, basically. And that sort of is something that we kind of look at because a university funding cycles can be short term in nature. Uh, but I, I think this this project shows that there are certain instances that can be the ex can and should be the exception. Uh, I'm Lexi Angelo. I'm a PhD in creative writing. Um, and sort of building on what you just said there, uh, I was just wondering sort of trend wise, anecdotally, as you were going through the data, did you notice any specific trends or themes that popped out to you? Like, was there a common age that you would be accused of at, of witchcraft? Um, was there a common profession? And I was really curious about that sort of mind map that you had showing all the accusers. Um, I'm curious if, if witchcraft sort of if Scottish witches stayed in Scotland or if they migrated uh, and jumped across the, the pond and came to, to North America, or if you saw any connections or any trends that you saw through that. Shall I try and um, answer that one? How long have we got? <laughs> yeah. Um, occupation for most witches, peasant. You know, that's not how, what they call themselves, of course, but you know, they're subsistence farmers, most of them. And you know, when you see all these odd occupations listed on the survey website, that's something to bear in mind. Most of these people are just farming and getting their living from that. And they stay in very local areas. And um, um, one of the things I hope that the data will be able to be able to use for is to, to show um, you know, sort of patterns of accusation. And often it's very, very local. So the accused witches themselves very rarely move, except in fantasy. Um, you know, the, we've, we've got um, witches just after the coronation of Charles II in, in London in 1660, um, who fly to see the coronation in London. Also, oh, that's, you know, that's what they, they, they confess to having done. So, yeah, the, there's, there's movement in fantasy, but no, they don't travel. Um, but the ideas travel. These are international ideas, and um, and and you know, the the notorious panic in in Salem, Massachusetts, in 1692. It's all about demonic possession. You know, a few years later, a whole lot of demonic possession cases arise in Scotland. You know, I don't think that's an accident. More work needs to be done on how these ideas travel. But um, yeah, it's you know, even when witches are being accused, there's, it's not just one single thing one single occupation, one single idea. Um, you know, in, um, it's, it, over the few hundred years that it happens, it's constantly evolving. And yeah, uh, that's the short version. Happy, okay. Uh, yep, over here. Yeah, I'm Megan. I work in student support here at the university. Um, curious how you determined when you're talking about the memorial, some of the memorials. There was one where you said there's no, this this woman never existed. How did you make the determination whether or not someone is just undocumented or it had just grown up a urban myth? Or no, urban. Shall I take that one? Yeah. I'm a historian. We work with primary sources. If we've got a document that was actually written at the time, or it's a credible copy of a document written at the time by people who knew what was being said and what was being done. That is the evidence that we work on. The past isn't out there. Just because it happened doesn't mean we know about it. Um, and it's not up to me to prove a negative. You know, um, it's, it, it's up to the people who say that Maggie Wall did exist to produce the evidence. And so far, nobody's found it. So um, uh, that, that's, that's where we stand with Maggie Wall. Uh, you know, maybe one day someone will find it, but just because there's a monument, it doesn't prove that there was a witch. 
Um, and one can see stories evolving. Um, the, yeah, the, mm, the the forest which is stone is another one. You know that 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 acquired um, an interpretative board in the twentieth century, and you know new stories started to be told. And you know we're a storytelling species, and um, you know we you know we need to, we need to tell more stories. They don't all have to be true. It, you know, so long as they're meaningful, sometimes it helps to know what the evidence is for these stories. I'm not sure if that's an answer to your question, but it, it, some thoughts that might help. But manuscript, primary documents, that's what we work on. And um, we then ask questions from those documents. Um, I think also to add to that, we were really, really mindful um, with the map of memorials when we were distinguishing between a site of interest, what is a memorial and what is a tourist attraction. Um, you'll see on there we have included um, like the, the dungeons in Edinburgh, which was a decision that we didn't take lightly to include, but we've included them under tourist attraction because people do go to the dungeons um, looking for stories of witchcraft. So it's um, up to us to include these in the sort of way that we can put them in context, I suppose. So when we're talking about memorializations, um, it's Maggie Ward, I think she's under a site of interest, not a memorial. Um, so for these people who were not sure, you know, there's no evidence they existed, we were really mindful of what category we were putting them in. And with Maggie Ward, we decided site of interest suited more than a memorial. Okay, um, yes, uh, yep. Hi everyone, my name's Lorraine and I research in the West Coast. Um, the question I had was more about the, the project and the website. If there was, and it might actually be to you, if there was a wish list or more funding or more time, what would you like to achieve? What would you like to do next? How would you like to see this project develop? I can have a shot at that one if you like. Yeah. Um... I'd like to fix the basic survey that needs to be done. Right at you know at the root of all this is a, a, a database that was built in two thousand and three, and it's showing its age. Um, to to bring this further forward, what we would like, and you showed a bit of this, we would like the primary sources digitized. You know there are many many thousands of words of evidence and documentation that lies behind the research that the, that, um, that the original survey did, that the interns have done. If we could get all that, digitize it, this could then be harnessed using the, the, um, the power of AI and digital humanities and it, uh, um, you know, far more information um, would become available. So, um so getting the getting the primary sources getting them digitized getting them added to the website and made searchable um that that's that, that that's a, very much a gleam in my eye and um, i want to talk to some people in in the room about this at some point but thank you for your question yeah, i've also uh i've not added all the sources yet it's quite a a, a job uh, there was 5,000 entries on in the Survey of Scottish Witchcraft. I've gone through about 1,000 of them and uh, added page scans from the Privy Council of Scotland and Pittman's Criminal Trials of Scotland. Thank you. I like the aspects of the website where it's, it is about telling the story. Um, I like the timelines, but I also like, with, is it the witch pricker's journey? The, although the, the witches didn't travel... The witch prickers did, and they traveled through from town to town, discovering the witches and seeing that journey through time, I think is a really interesting story. And I would like to see more um, more stories told or interfaces that help us to see a, a, a story over time or over a, over a journey. Um, and I would also like to feature, so I'd love... <laughs> To take some modern institutions like perhaps the University of Edinburgh, because as was named a uh, name drop there, at least one of our vice chancellors is res responsible for um, crying and condemning a couple of witches. And because um, the university was around at this time, um, being as it is 500 years old. 
Um, and Agnes Finney is our nearby, most nearby witch, and she had a shop at Potter Road, just where the Students Association Potter Shop is right now. And I think it would be really interesting to take some kind of slices or lenses um, to help institutions or land, you know, the university owns an enormous amount of buildings in the city, you know, to just help um, tell the stories from it through some other lenses. But if you have suggestions, this is, you know, come and tell us. And um, yeah, it, we can do whatever interests you, but also if we can match it with the students experience like the geolocation or the software engineering or the um, history um, graduates, uh, students um, bring a lens, we can go try and find the right person. I'll also just mention I'm seeing some empty glasses and some full bottles over there. So uh, we might try and draw this to a close. Uh, if, but if you've got a really important question, I'll, I'll take them now. But yeah, maybe we should start thinking of wrapping up slightly so we can discuss informally as well. Hi, um, I'm Sai and I'm an artist, but I'm interested in like uh, mythography and like that kind of practice. Um, I was curious, kind of like, um, like how you're saying about like hiring interns and things. I was curious about how you get involved in that way with like, I don't know, like archivists, but like, this is an interesting topic. So I was curious about it. <laughs> um, I think in the case of me and Ruby, it was, it was a job that was advertised. Um, I found on the university website, is that the same as you Ruby for internships for students? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, uni temps or career ed, I think is the, but um, it, I just found it on there and, and thought it was um, a fantastic thing to apply to. So yeah, that's how it worked, I think, for, for Ruby and I. They're all University of Edinburgh current students. Yeah. Internships with us and we have two different shapes of internships. We have summer internships, which is full time for, is it eight weeks, six, eight weeks? 12, 12, weeks. 12 weeks and we also have one day a week all the way through the um academic year internships this is paid work um and they uh, come and join our teams our professional teams um and some of them come back again and again and um we're very pleased with that and many of them go on to really um interesting careers so we've been having student interns now in the in the team for 10 years and many of them have gone on to really quite interesting graduate jobs. So I'm, I'm very pleased with the its work experience in digital roles. It's great fun. <laughs> yeah. I'd also just mention there is also the uh, what's called the Student Experience Grants Project, uh, where you can apply for up to £5,000. And it needs to be a project that's initiated by the students. Uh, so sometimes you know, you can put a project to the student experience grant people and they say yes. So if you wanted to do something like that, be, you know, I'd, I'd welcome that and collaborate with that. But uh, I'd also say like, the, there's a point I want to make about sort of art and imagery, which is something we've discussed for a while is what the role of art is, in a topic like this and whether it misrepresents the lived experience of 16th and 17th century women or helps people engage and have a, an emotional resonance and connection with the topic. And it's something we've been trying to explore for a while, but not come to a satisfactory conclusion on. So that might be something for further exploration because uh, I some people, I think it might help with their connection, not just with the names, but it's whether it's necessary or yeah, it, it's a, yeah. if I could come in on that yeah it, this is part of this the stories you know the, the uh, um you know stories don't just have to be text and words you know stories can be represented visually so the um so yeah the these play a part in stimulating our imaginations and helping us understand so uh so so all 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 these all these things have um a part to play. Uh, so have we got 
how many hands have we got left? Any sort of just just one? Oh yeah, one two. Okay, maybe make these the last two, and then sort of uh, we'll we'll hang around for a bit, and you're welcome to hang around and avail yourselves of our, all our soft drinks and wine. Uh, as in, but uh, yeah, let's take the last two questions and then thank everyone again. Okay, uh, so let's go with you first, and then back over here. Hi, my name's Erin. I'm a student from California. And obviously, you all have done a tremendous job at helping create this resource. Um, and I'm curious, once you have finished refining it, what is your plan regarding the advertisement? Um, I know that it was mentioned that this resource is heading out to schools, which I think is phenomenal. Um, and it's also posted on a third party website, if correct me if I'm wrong. Um, or it was posted on rest anyways. But um, would you ever consider QR codes or reaching out to local tour groups to help get this out for people visiting Scotland, such as ourselves? And this is applicable to anyone. <laughs> Thank you. So is this about the tour specifically or about the, the map as well? Um, I guess the tour is- The tour, okay. Well, um, our team at Curious Edinburgh, they are um, the people, they're the machine behind the tour. They have all the tours on their website. Um, and I think a lot of the, public, the publicizing of it is done internally, I suppose, by university things. But um, a QR codes, I mean, we've got, I've got a QR code link to the app and things, but but would you like to would you like them to be made more available around the university or that's okay true. yeah that's kind of where I'm at I okay like having it more accessible especially just to the general public would be phenomenal yeah absolutely I mean the um the website is available public available publicly and so is the app and it would be great if actually you know there are so many tours around Edinburgh that are to do with witchcraft and they're getting more and you'll walk past people down the street with their witch hats on and their sticks out nothing wrong with that but our tour we wanted um we wanted to really make it like factual and accurate so if tour guys did want to read the tour and incorporate it in their own ideas I mean that'd be fantastic I've recently started tour guiding myself and it's it's a really useful tool for me it's been fantastic so uh yeah I think that that'd be a, a great thing to do in, in terms of making it more public and making it more accessible I'm not sure it'd be the curious Edinburgh team I think that um would help out the most with that do you want to answer for the map um, well, so when it was first launched in 2019, I think the kind of word spread quite naturally by people using it and like people would post about it in Facebook and things like, um, like, oh my gosh, this accused witch lived near me. And like that's kind of word spread around it because like within the first year it had over like 100,000 user visits and it got picked up by quite a few different media outlets. Like it was even mentioned in New York Times. Um, Currently, the new version has just kind of been advertised internally, so I guess that is something what we need to think a bit more about how we'll spread the word about this. But if it's already a resource people use, it's the same URL as the previous version from 2019, so this will be now the version that people visit. And if you Google um, Accuse Witch of Scotland, it should also um, come up high up in the Google search, so that will also help people have access to it. Yeah, I'm just uh, going to add that you, you I'm uh, going to ask you to record a video about how to get the best out of the website as well. Uh, but just before you go. <laughs> Thank you, speak about Curious Edinburgh. Yes, so Curious Edinburgh also for all the other tours has an Instagram page mm -hmm. and also is on Facebook and on Twitter. And any advice for further spreading, very welcome. We might use a, a marketing <laughs> intern at one point. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously not that witches are purely seasonal, but this time of year, and as we head to Halloween, is usually when we see a big spike in hits. So if you are on the socials and you want to say that you were here and that there is a new launch of, of the new version of the witches website, um, we usually get quite a lot of traffic around uh, the end of this month. Um, because, And that's what got the international um, traffic, I think, because we launched around just before Halloween. Um, five or seven years ago. We also got a lot of traffic on the site during the campaign for the pardons of the witches and or the innocent women rather than the witches. Um, and we know that the uh, campaign for the, Scot the Witches of Scotland campaign used the website a lot to help engage people to thinking about how these witches sit, you know, sit in the places that we sit now. Um, and 
so I think if it's if people are it's it is open to the public and people find it um at the times that they're looking for witches um which is more often than you'd think I would say. so uh, I'll just also say like since the demise of Twitter or the rebrand if you like things are a lot more fragmented now so it's a sort of mixed approach and anything you can do to help spread the word or or suggest places or people or institutions we should be in contact with it all helps thanks sorry another two very very quick questions if that's okay the first one really follows on from what you were saying ruby um just really about visitors and traffic i'm interested do you find that the map is it basically um, users from Scotland? I know it will be international. Is there a particular area that you tend to find that people would be visiting from? And the other quick question is, is there a criteria for memorials? So I know that you said that there'd been a lot of discussion about memorials. Is it a place of interest? Is it actually a memorial, how it would categorise? Because some of the memorials I know local to me are not actually things well they are things but they're not places they're not stone they're not things like that so would that be something that you would be able to incorporate I'm just thinking for example we have a memorial that is actually a piece of art um you know so how how would that be defined and is that something that maybe because I think it would be of interest to people that they might want to visit but it wouldn't fall into the typical category yeah, I'll just jump off from that last question. Um, we have included pieces of art in sites of interest. So we've got the Isabel Gaudi um, the mural up in um, Old Earn. So we've included that as a, a piece of art um, under a site of interest. So um, yeah, that's why we're really so hot on having these three separate things so that you can encapsulate the whole sort of uh, people's efforts to remember the, the witches. So I think it, uh, arts, works of art would fall under a site of interest. I'll just add that it probably has to be fixed to the ground so you can put it on a map. Yes, <laughs> has to have a location. <laughs> Yeah, and in terms of um, where most of the traffic comes from, it definitely is the majority of Scotland because I think most users look kind of looking at where they live and stuff and that's why people are interested in it because people are like... Um, interested in their local history and things like that. But I can't remember the exact number, but can you remember how many countries it was that it visited the site? It was a lot. 120? It was a lot of countries that had visited the site, but majority of users are Scottish, which I think does make sense. Um, but yeah, because it's also, I don't think any other country does have a plotted map of accused witches like this. So I think other countries probably, um, that is why they're interested as well, because um, it's kind of one of its kind right now, but um, because when we were at Wiki Mania, like I think Spain as well, they were saying how they were interested in doing something similar, and if we'd ever include other countries, but it's based on the survey of Scottish witchcraft, um, so that's why it is Scottish witches. But I think it probably does inspire some other countries to do similar things as well. Um, also, uh, yeah, it's what's quite it's quite amazing is that when you look at the. Google Analytics behind the site that there is countries from all around the world accessing it, places like Fiji and Namibia. And that, that that's just amazing. We did have a spike at one point from Turkey. Uh, I think that was due to we we uh the co our colleague Stuart Cromar, who did the design for the icons based on the, the News of Scotland woodcut, he 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 did some investigation and found that. There was a social media post on Twitter that was shared in Turkish in a Turkish publication. And they said it was something like the lungs. Have you seen this? This is amazing. And suddenly we had this 100,000 sort of view visits from sort of Turkey. And we were like, where where has this come from? But it was, it was just an interesting sort of side note that I thought I'd mentioned. I think also the map of memorials might be missing some. I can't find all Dern or Monzi. So we're also missing a few pictures. I did try to get some pictures of the Tully Bowl maze of Lord Roderick Moncrief, uh, but they were uploaded to Wikimedia Commons and then deleted again. But there we go. So any pictures you can take of memorials or your suggestions for art, I, I think it's just a category of memorialization. I don't think it's in any, any less of a, a memorial. So we welcome sort of augmenting and enhancing our map with further entries.
uh, I think we should probably wrap up and drink the rest of the uh, stuff there. So can I thank, get you to thank Ellie, Julian and Ruby once again? I'm going to thank, thank Andrew and Melissa, and Andrew in particular, because he was up till midnight last night trying to get this working. Uh, but a round of applause for yourselves as well. Thanks very much for coming, and help yourself to wine and drinks. <laughs>